Good morning, Discovery. Good morning, Houston. How about them Indians? That's exactly what we were going to say. How about them Indians? And we knew that would wake you up. Sorry to beat you to it, but that's a great choice of music. Uh, the Indians are doing fantastic. We're so happy. Sure are, just like you all up there. This is Mission Control Houston. The wake up music today for the crew of Discovery was Talkin' Tribe, the song about the Cleveland Indians who are about 15 games ahead in their division at this point in the Major League Baseball season. Four of the members of the Discovery crew are from Ohio and taking a lot of pride in the Indians' performance this year. Discovery, if you're not on the flight deck, you've got a fantastic view of the Nile Delta, the pyramids, Cairo, Suez Canal coming up. You're right, the story it is beautiful. Discovery Houston for Mary Ellen, no action on the BDS message. Copy. And we're ready to do the event early uh, if you are, Discovery. We're ready, Mark. Discovery, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, Discovery, we are ready. CNN, this is Houston. Please call Discovery for a voice check. Discovery, this is CNN. How do you hear me? CNN, this is Discovery. We have you loud and clear. You guys look good this morning. We'll um, we'll get started. I'm going to do a little 10-second, you know, hello and who you are, and then we'll just plunge in. Um, my order of battle here is to go uh, Mary Ellen first, and then Nancy, and then Don, and um, if that 
make, I'm going to try to do it as three separate things so you guys don't have to play past the microphone in this delay, you know, during the interview. Where are you? We're on the mid-deck of Discovery. Okay, great. I couldn't tell. It uh, doesn't look like the mid-deck I know and love. It looks like something else behind you there. Great. Okay, here we go. This is actually the wall where we usually have sleeping bags, uh, and uh, that's what's keeping us stable against the wall right now. <laughs> I envy you. You talked about envy and the mirror gang. Jeez, I envy the uh, Discovery gang. Yeah. Okay, we're going to start with me, Joe. Here we go. We're joined by three mission specialists aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery. Orbiting more than 150 miles above the Earth right now, the team of scientists includes Mary Ellen Weber, Nancy Curry, and Don Thomas. We're talking to them from the mid-deck of the space shuttle this morning. Mary Ellen, let me start with you. Um, I'd like you to think back to launch day last week. I know this was your first trip into space. Uh, I want to know what was going through your mind as you left the Earth for the first time and what it was like to experience weightlessness for the first time. Well, it was really awesome. The thing that kept going through my mind was, we're really going, we're really going, it's really happening. And uh, it was just incredible shaking, uh, awesome sense of power. And that's what I was thinking about, and I was thinking ahead to what I needed to do once we got to Miko, or main engine cutoff. And at main engine cutoff, you instantly feel weightlessness. And it's pretty different. It's, it's definitely interesting. I've done a little bit of training on a parabolic uh, aircraft back in Houston experiencing microgravity, but uh, experiencing it nonstop was, was awesome. Yeah. Did, did you or any of your pals get sick? Uh, yeah, one or two of us did get sick. That's correct. How bad is that, and how long does it last generally, and what do you do about it? Well, it doesn't last too bad. It, it comes in varying degrees with varying crew members. And we do have some medication that we can take that still lets us adapt to it while we're on the medication. But unfortunately, one of the side effects is that you get very drowsy. So uh, typically, you only take that before you go to bed that night. But it usually only takes a day or two to adapt. And right now, all five of us are up to speed. Yeah. As I was preparing to talk to you this morning, I was sitting at my computer typing out questions, and I discovered the A key on my computer doesn't work. Uh, do you have problems like that when you're up there? I, I know I can take my computer to the computer guy here, and he can fix it. Do you have somebody who can do minor repairs like that? And have you had many problems like that? Well, certainly with a vehicle that has millions and millions of parts on it, I mean, some of them are going to fail. And we do have two crew members, in this case, Nancy Sherlock, who's to the left of me, and Kevin Kriegel, the pilot, are trained for IFM, or in-flight maintenance. And so we have a set of tools and, and various implements that help us fix things when they do break, and usually we can fix them. Yeah. I've been looking, um, while we were preparing for the interview down here on Earth, at uh, a bunch of things that look like pictures through a microscope. I'm, I'm not totally sure what you're doing and how it's going to help people down here on Earth. What's your take on that? Well, that particular experiment is looking at fish embryos, and it's looking at the way, uh, the way gravity affects embryos, in this case fish, but it could apply to people and other animals. And even as an embryo, you're developing your sensors, which will... Uh, give you the indications of which way is up and which way is down, and what they're doing is they're looking at uh, what happens to the fish that develop without gravity in that development stage. Yeah. All right, would you pass the microphone over to Nancy for a minute? Nancy, I've, a, I've been a private pilot for about three months now. I've been training to do this for a, a long, long time. I know you've got 3,300 hours minimum. Uh, particularly in helicopters. How is it different to be on the space shuttle compared to, to being in a helicopter or being in a fixed-wing plane on Earth? I think from the standpoint of being a pilot, I've probably seen it all. Before the treetop levels with the uh, night vision goggles in the Army, also flown uh, turboprop airplanes in the Army, T-38s with NASA at 41,000 feet, and now the space shuttle at 260 miles, and now on this mission at 160 miles. So I think in terms of aviation, I've covered basically all the ground you can cover. <laughs> Is it a lot different 
the, in, in uh, reality for the, uh, for the launch and in the practice that you've done for the landing, is it, uh, is it a lot different as a pilot to, to bring this thing down than it would be to, to bring down a, a helicopter or an airplane? Oh, it's tremendously different, but uh, Tom and Kevin have both been training for years uh, to accomplish this approach and landing. Uh, I used to work as a flight simulation engineer on the airplane that we use, the shuttle training aircraft, which is an excellent simulator of the flight dynamics of the orbiter during the approach and landing phase. So they're more than ready to go. They have a minimum of 500 approaches in that airplane before they ever land the orbiter. Yeah. Um, there, uh, as the shuttle was going up, one of the things that NASA was trying to find out was, how does this new improved main engine work? I'm sure you couldn't tell a difference in how it felt, but um, could you see any difference on the meters that you were monitoring uh, in, in its performance compared to the other two? Uh, the performance of all three engines was as stable as, uh, as ever. Um, the ride uphill was as smooth. Uh, I've only had two launches, but as smooth as I've ever felt. Uh, you know, I'd use the description in second stage once the solids were off. It was more or less an electric ride. It was just as smooth as can be. The parameters of the engines all looked nominal, and uh, all three engines operated uh, just excellently. Yeah, what goes through your mind when you take off? And as you say, you've done it a few times now. What, uh, what do you think about? Well, Don and our classmates, we were both selected in 1990. We celebrated our fifth anniversary of being selected as astronauts yesterday. And uh, when we came out of, of the hold, we gave each other a thumbs up and kind of a high five because we knew what was about to happen. And we also both had mirrors out so that we could look at the overhead windows and uh, not only watch as the main engine slip, but watch as we rolled heads down. So I think the second time around, you're a little uh, calmer perhaps. You know what to expect. Uh, you know when to put the mirror down and immediately put your focus back on the, uh, the instruments that we have inside the cockpit to monitor all the parameters during the ascent. Yeah. There are dozens of experiments on board. Uh, tell me what is most interesting in those experiments to you, Which, if there's one or if there are a couple that are uh, more interesting to you than the others. Well, we have uh, a couple that I think complement each other very nicely. We have one that's a protein crystal growth experiment, and we're growing alpha interferon crystals. We went ahead and activated that right after the deployment of the TDRS satellite on the very first flight day. So those crystals have been forming. We'll continue to do so until landing time. And uh, alpha interferon is an antiviral and anti-cancer drug, and its development uh, here in space, we can develop crystals in a much more pure form. We also have another experiment called the microencapsulation in space, which by microencapsulating drugs, you can induce long-term effects, for example, for vaccines. So I think in terms of pharmaceuticals, we're doing quite a bit of work up here during our eight-day mission. Yeah. How do you think and how long do you think it will take for things that you are working on today to actually come into use, uh, particularly these medical things, down here on Earth? When can I go to the hospital and get a micro-encapsulated drug, you know, to give me some medicine that I need? Well, particularly when you're talking about pharmaceutical testing, you have a problem uh, with the uh, testing required for the drug and, and the length of time required for that due to FDA standards. So I think uh, probably within seven years, ten years at the latest, before you'd have actually see some uh, relative feedback into the community in general. Yeah. How's your vision, and uh, are there any other physical changes that you are um, poking you and your colleagues and prodding to, to try to find out uh, how your bodies are different on this trip? Well, I always enjoy space because uh, you tend to grow about 1%, and being 5 foot, it gives me a chance to be actually 5 foot 1 or 5 foot 2 for a short time. Uh, the other uh, interesting thing that I noticed this mission, much more so than my first one, is that uh, near vision, uh, particularly the adaptation from looking at far vision and back in close at perhaps a checklist or to read procedures, takes much more uh, longer period of time for your eyes to adapt to that close-in field. Yeah. All right. Pass the mic over to Don Thomas, if you will. Uh, but you've been smiling through this whole thing, and uh, I hope you'll keep smiling as we talk here. I want to find out uh, from I'll try, you John. <laughs> about the experiments you're running. Um, you're known here on Earth as uh, the, uh, the zookeeper in space. How's it going with the, uh, with the live animals and the eggs and the embryos? Well, as you know, uh, we have 10 pregnant rats on board. This is an experiment with the National Institute of Health 
that we're uh, working in cooperation with them and the Ames Research Center. And uh, the investigation is focusing on looking at the muscular development and also the bone loss mechanisms in the rodents, and hopefully we'll be able to translate this over to humans on the earth. It's particularly important for elderly people where you have osteoporosis or weakening of the bones. If we can understand bone loss mechanisms in space, maybe we can understand why elderly people lose calcium and have weakening of the bones and be able to apply this to uh, help many people back on earth. Yeah, you're excited about this, aren't you? I'm pretty excited about it. I love the research we're doing up here, and uh, you can't get a better laboratory to work in or a, a greater group of people to work with than uh, those associated with NASA here. Yeah, the space program is getting a lot of publicity right now. Uh, last, uh, uh, this month's docking mission with the Mir was pretty exciting. What you were doing, I imagine, is just as exciting to you. There's this Apollo 13 movie right now. Uh, do you see uh, support for what you are doing in space growing back here on Earth? sure do. Uh, we have an amateur radio on board here, and we've been going around the earth talking to many schools during the last five days, and the kids are as enthusiastic today as I was when John Glenn first went up in 1962. So I, I really see uh, kids get, being enthusiastic, and these kids today are going to grow up to be enthusiastic uh, scientists, engineers, and carry our space program into the next century. Yeah. One of the most unusual things about this mission to me, and I think to other people here on earth, is that it came so soon after Atlantis landed, uh, just, just a few days later. Did you have any apprehension that, uh, about the fact that you were going to go up so soon after another shuttle had been in orbit? I had no apprehension uh, whatsoever. The same people that launched uh, Apollo 11 26 years ago yesterday are down at the cave, the same caliber, and uh, we have the greatest group of people working at the Kennedy Space Center to get vehicles ready. They uh, got Atlantis on the ground after the 71 mission, and within a few days we have another team uh, getting us ready for launch. So I think it's a tribute to the Kennedy Space Center and the great group of people down there that, and their can-do attitude that uh, we were able to launch successfully right on time. Yeah. I've talked to a lot of young people in the past couple of weeks about the fact that I would be talking to you today, and they said to me, well, we want to know about some of the weird things that you can do in space that you can't do on Earth or that you can't do in space that you uh, uh, can do on Earth. Is it true that you can't whistle? Okay. John, I could never really whistle that well, but you, you can still do it up in space. <laughs> How about smell and taste? Uh, one of our assignment editors said... Uh, how bad is the food up there? The food is its uh, typical, like, camping food. Um, I've had better food in restaurants, and I've had worse food than up here. And uh, it, it's, it's good enough to get us through the mission. Some of the selections that we get to make, uh, I really enjoy. Other ones I'm not too wild about. It's really an in individual thing here. As far as taste and smell goes, uh, some astronauts experience a, a blandness in space where they need spicier food, but for myself, the same foods that I enjoy on Earth, I enjoy up here, such as stadium mustard from Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> now, while you guys have been up there in relative comfort, there has been a monstrous heat wave down here on the Earth. It's uh, been above 100 degrees in the Midwest for a few days. It's been uh, near 100 and over in the northeastern United States. Now, you've been in space several times. I know that if you get spare time, you like to look out the window at the planet below. Does it look any different down here right now? Uh, particularly in the U.S. Midwest and uh, and uh, Southeast, than it uh, than it has on your previous trips with all this uh, this monstrous heat. Well, I flew in space uh, exactly a year ago. I was on orbit aboard STS-65. That was a 15-day mission. Got to look out the window a lot, and the cloud patterns have changed, and and some of the ocean currents are different. But basically, the planet looks you know very similar to what it did uh, a year ago. So. There's nothing we can see up here that uh, you know gives us an indication of why it's so hot, but uh, we're welcome to share our Houston weather with the rest of the country. Last question for any of you who want to take it. What's the most amazing, surprising thing that's happened to you on your trip? The view out the window. Uh, it is just incredible and amazing. Last night before going to bed, the last thing we saw was a, a sunset, and it was just spectacular. Words can't describe it. All right. Thank you all three for joining us on CNN today. Thank you. Goodbye. Houston, CNN, that concludes the event.
Discovery Houston, we're about a minute to the ZOE. We'll pick you up again at 2214. Great interview. Now coming into view uh, from Discovery is the Baja Peninsula, the southern extreme of that uh, peninsula, and the Gulf of uh, California. center of the screen is uh, Miami, so it zooms in. And now coming into view are the Bahamas. the island of Andros. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, this view from Discovery showing a tropical depression forming in the Pacific uh, south of the tip of the Baja Peninsula. This is uh, an as yet unnamed storm, uh, just a tropical depression uh, in its early stages. Again, off the uh, Mexican coast in the Pacific. Houston, we had about 10 seconds of that pinched cable. Now we have the picture again. Okay, again, uh, where we're pointing right there, that's uh, what we found pinched in the door in MF57 Alpha. And uh, the back planer stopped, and that's where uh, we found the, the pinch wire. And actually, it was when we started up the back planer going from... Uh, the pantry food area to the uh, the WCS is uh, when we found out that it didn't work anymore. And inspecting the wire further, we had two other places. Those are two other places we discovered on the wire that also had some damage. So we cut the wire. And the wire status right now is? And do you need anything further there, Houston? Kevin, if you just tell us where that uh, spliced 
section is in relation to the connector cable, and otherwise we've got a good video of it. Only one break in the wire, correct? That's correct. Uh, we have about three feet where you see the four wires coming out. That attaches to the vacuum cleaner, and we have about three feet of wire to the vacuum cleaner, and then the rest of the wire goes to the connector. And Discovery, if you just hold this view, understand this is a tape downlink. We'd like to get a rotation of that spliced section so we could see all sides of it. Discovery, we have all the video we need there. Thank you. Great work.